For those of you who are sitting in the very back, that number was presented by just the women of the choir, and it was really beautiful. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, and starting in verse 12. And just pre preceding these verses, Jesus was giving them the, the analogy of, of how he is the, the true vine and the Father is the gardener and that we are the branches of the vine. And Jesus continues to talk with them and he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. For many people in this world, some of whom who are living very close to this church where we are, they live in a world where they have very little money. They may be attempting to raise a number of children. They may be isolated from their family and support. They could even be addicted to drugs. Many are possessing not an, enough education and not much hope of getting more. Their lives seemingly are of quite des quiet desperation and they feel powerless. Powerless to improve, powerless to change their situation in life, powerless to protect themselves from those who would prey upon them. And the lack of power can freeze them into a life without joy. On the other hand, some people in this world have seemed to have gained a great deal of power. People like the politician who's won the election has gained control over much assets and many lives of people. And we've certainly had our share of that in Louisiana. It could be the entrepreneur businessman who has gained control over a struggling company and is now in a position to exert that control by changing of policies and management. Or maybe it's the leader of a fast-growing church who is gaining fame, influence, and money by his preaching and is being idolized by his adoring followers power, whether you have it or you don't, we all seem to want some, don't we? And we want to wield our power rather than having somebody wield it over us. Will the politician use his power to improve the lives of his citizenry, or will he use it to amass money and influence for himself and his cronies? Will the businessman protect the stockholder's investment? Will he save the jobs of the dedicated workers? Or will he break up the company and sell it off? Or the preacher, will he use his position to bring people to God? Or will he use it to build his own little kingdom that is ruled by him and his insiders, not by the Holy Spirit. Obviously, we can 
deduce that power can be used for great good or unimaginable evil. We can think of the Holocaust and the terrible consequences of the way the Nazis used their power, some of which they gained through force and trickery and some of which they gained through the acquiescence of the German people. We think of parents who use their power to abuse their children or grown children who take advantage of their power to take advantage of their enfeebled elderly parents. Or the Enron executives recently in the news who abused their power and caused thousands to lose their retirement investments. But on the other hand, we've observed how power can be used for good, like this country did, as we rebuilt Europe and Japan after World War II, minimizing the after effects of that terrible war. We've seen the power of a bill in Melissa Gates Foundation, where literally billions of dollars of money is going to improve education and eradicate diseases all across the face of the world. And we, you and I, we personally have known people who have had power, and they've used it to do tremendous good, some of which you probably know in this congregation. And there's the enigma of power being used ostensibly for good, but really to satisfy a personal need. As in the case of a true story that Fred Craddock tells about when he was teaching at an institution of higher learning in Oklahoma. And a very powerful and rich businessman called the president of the university saying he'd be interested in giving them some money to improve preaching. And the president, of course, was thrilled and said he'd come down and talk with him. And he asked Fred if he'd like to go with him. So they did. They went down and talked to the man. And after a while, the man said, well, before we do this, he said, I, we probably need to have prayer. So the president didn't pray, and Fred didn't pray, but the man did. He had the money, he had the power, and he had the prayer. Then he took out his pen, and he poised it above the papers that were presented, that were prepared for his, by his lawyers for the donation, and he said, this will be used to improve preaching, won't it? And they said, oh yeah, every penny of it will be used to improve preaching. And then he said, now you understand, none of this goes to women or blacks. And Fred and the president said they couldn't accept the money under those conditions. And they got up to leave. And the president looked at the man, the man said, well, you know, there are plenty of other schools that will. And he was right. The man gave over $60 million in his lifetime to churches and schools, but not one penny went for the benefit of women or blacks. Because we see awful misuses of power. It's tempting for someone, any of us, to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't worry about power at all. Let's don't use our power. Let God do it. He's all powerful. But the only problem with this is that God has done an interesting thing. He himself has given us power. In Genesis, he told first man that he was giving him power to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the creatures that lived on the earth, involving him and us in the ongoing creation. And we must look at our environment sometimes and wonder how we're doing about that, but nonetheless, it seems abundantly clear that we have been given this power by God. And in today's scripture, Jesus takes that transference of power and he instructs us at a deeper level 
on what God's concept of power is and about the relationship that Christ envisioned for us. Jesus here is not talking only to his disciples but to his followers and to us. As I said earlier, it follows his very descriptive imagery of how he is the vine, we are the branches. And he states in the text, he no longer does he call us servants. For now he calls us his friends. And I say, wow, that means the son of God. The son of God is putting us into the position of being his friend. And in the original text, friend, the word, is derived from one of the Greek words meaning love. So it takes on the connotation of not just being a friend, but being a loved one friend. And he says he can do this because now he's shared with us everything that he has learned from the Father. And this happened all because Jesus chose to have this kind of relationship with us. And then he says, not only have I chose you, but I've appointed you. And you are go out and bear fruit. And the bearing of the fruit means to act in love. And then amazingly, we have some sort of equal status with Jesus because we can ask for anything in his name. The traditional way of looking at power is a hierarchical pyramid with power flowing up and down the pyramid with the most powerful one sitting at the top. Now Jesus is giving us another definition of how power ought to be structured. And as Bob Allen used to say in his preaching sometimes, I wish he hadn't said that. Remember the vine and the branches? The branches all look alike. They're intertwined with each other. They sustain and support each other. And Jesus is suggesting that his followers ought to live in a non-hierarchical community with no one above another. And that's real tough for us who live in a Western civilization with our concept of individual autonomy, power, and privacy. Yet the first New Testament communities were apparently very much like this. Communities of interrelationship, mutuality. And some of this is going around us today. Look at the neighborhoods that the Shreveport Bossier Community Renewal are trying to build. Neighborhoods that are being built up block by block by block with each block anchored by a house of help and hope and love. And they call these houses friendship houses. And there's the Delancey Street Project the Lancy Street Project is a prison alternative prison, uh, program that began out in San Francisco. It's for young men and women who have gotten in trouble and are headed toward prison, but they can voluntarily go into this program. The organization is flat. It's run by the people who are there who are in the prison alternative program themselves. It's self-governing, and it acts to build up the members of this community as well as the communities in which they are set. It receives no government money. It's completely self-sustaining. It's handled over 15,000 young men and women since its inception. It has a recidivism rate of less than 10%. It is a community that acts in love. From our culture's perspective, 
power is held by those who've gained the top of the heap and now wield the power that they say they have earned. But in the view that John has given us, the power is really shared, not only by God with us, but also by us with each other. And now power is no longer finite, it's now limitless because it's multiplied by those of us who are friends of Jesus. Who has the power was the question. And I think the answer is that God has 100% and we have 100%. God is sharing his power with us. Remember, Jesus tells us just a few verses back from where we read today that he will do greater things. We will do greater things than he does. And so we cannot do that with it unless we have the power that God gives us. Well, it would be hard for us to live in those kind of First Testament communities and sharing communities where lives are so interdependent. So how do we reconcile these very two different lifestyles that there are? We must admit we're heavily invested in our culture and our hierarchical power that our government has, our social activities have, our economy has. And I'm not qualified for t predicting and telling you exactly how our culture is going to react in the future but I think maybe it should kind of look like this. For the foreseeable future, we will live in this world of Western culture where there are vertical organizations and where abuse of power will sometimes continue and be all too common. We're gonna to have to live in that world, but we are Christians we must also march to another drummer. And Jesus spells it out for us. Follow my command. Love each other as I have loved you. My friends, and after today's reading, doesn't the word friend take on a little bit different meaning for us? My friends, let us recognize Acknowledge that we all are able and are called to be Jesus' friends. And when we encounter situations when power has to be either used or dealt with, let us remember him and let us act in love. If you'll join me in prayer. Loving God. We are overwhelmed with the idea that you shared your power with us. We acknowledge that we alone are responsible for acting now for good or for bad. Let us recognize that your love for us should guide us so that we always act in love. We ask this in the name of your son who gave us the command to love each other as I have loved you. Amen.